facilitating the special formats section. Um, first presentation is going to be a remote one. Um, so this is going to be from Lindsay Weissenberger, who is the Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at the Irish Traditional Music Archive in Dublin, where she leads the linked Irish traditional music called Litmus Project. And as an Irish fiddle player and harpist, her role at the Irish Traditional Music Archive combines disembodied sociocultural knowledge with the challenge of representing, describing, organizing, and accessing music information as linked data. Um, her research on music information appears in the Journal of the Association for Information Science and Technology, Journal of Documentation, Knowledge Organization, and Library Management. So now you can all hear. Let's see. And hopefully this doesn't blow everyone's eardrums out. Hello participants of LD4. I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person, but I am going to be presenting my uh, paper titled Litmus, Irish Traditional Music and Dance. Here we are. So my name is Lindsay Weissenberger, and I am the Mary Curie Fellow at the Irish Traditional Music Archive in Dublin, Ireland. I'm going to be talking to you about the Litmus Project, which is known as the Linked Irish Traditional Music Project. And I'm going to be discussing the considerations for Irish traditional music and dance that have gone into the construction of the ontology and associated tools and the challenges of undertaking such a project. And I'm going to be giving a few future directions that the organization may consider to implement uh, traditional music with data. So first about litmus. The litmus project seeks to improve the uh, searching and access to web-based traditional music, song, and dance resources. And to do this, it involves the construction of a linked data ontology and framework for implementation. And it's going to account for music and dance relationships, geographic relationships, and personal relationships as linked data that will enable exploration by a variety of, um, of users, both uh, music practitioners and scholars and um, historians and enable the creation of new knowledge through these relationships and hopefully reuse by technical and cultural heritage sectors. The reason why we undertook this project is because current ontologies don't meet our needs and are oriented not towards folk and uh, traditional musics, but for um, classical music and commercial music. Uh, models. So this is something that's new because we're trying to account for oral transmission and the types of interactions that traditional musicians and dancers use themselves. Uh, and it will reflect this richness that you find in the, in the tradition. And as Irish traditional music is a global phenomenon, as well as uh, step dance, this means that litmus can help people all over the world discover uh, new connections in our collections. The ontology is going to consider both preservation information and cultural practices on the island, as well as in the Irish music di uh, diaspora and related traditions, as well as contextual information um, that are that's relevant particularly to the um, uh, the tunes themselves and the songs themselves um, and the musicians who are associated with these tunes and songs. So um, we're also going to try and implement the uh, traditional knowledge labels. And so to talk a bit more about linked data and Irish traditional music, first I want to talk about musician-musician relationships. So this image here is of um, uh, a family of fiddle players. They are um, well known because their father, John Kelly Sr., 
was a member of Keltori Kulan, or Musicians of Kulan, which is a, um, a revolutionary music group in the 1950s formed by Shauna Riva. And this was influential uh, for many decades to come. Uh, and eventually, um, this music group formed the Chieftains. So the two musicians on the right, um, the man seated is John Kelly Jr. And in the middle is James Kelly, his brother. And then um, on the far left is uh, Johnny, or John Jr., uh, Jr. Jr., who is the son of um, John Kelly Jr. So we've got two brothers and a son slash nephew. So there's, there's many families of musicians in Irish traditional music. And uh, these sorts of familial links are important to note because um, people will often be recognized not only on their own musical terms, but in association with their family as well. It's a very important um, uh, uh, affiliation to be affiliated with your musical family or other people who may um, sing or may dance. So the musician-musician relationships and the familial relationships are important to include. Next are the musician-to-music -mu relationships. These take the form of sort of loose and undefined relationships such as associated with or strongly associated with. And you find this type of relationship commented on uh, frequently. So musicians will say, uh, I'm going to play the jig, um, the yellow wattle, and this is strongly associated with Willie Clancy. This is his version of the tune. Um, and so it, in, in the uh, examples here, I have um, three tunes that are well known on their own, but the three musicians associated with them have Modify the tune to the point where it's recognizable as a different version. And it's still thought of as the same tune, but the strong musician association um, gives it almost a, an additional um, extended title. So Michael Russo's Mason's Apron, Willie Clancy's Yellow Wattle, and Joe Cooley's Morning Dew. You'll find people use, using the musician name in the title. Um, so it's important to make note of that. And in terms of dance music and dance, um, there are different types of dance that have been incorporated into the ontology. There's um, t conflicting terminology and in many cases non-existent terminology related to Irish dance. So this has been challenging to represent. There is both a group or social set dancing term and then there's a particular type of dance tune and solo dance that is known as a set dance, meaning there's a set um, choreography to these tunes because there's an irregularity in the number of measures and there's some sort of um, lopsided you know, asymmetry in the, the number of measures or sometimes the meter will change. So the dance steps have to be choreographed precisely. Um, that's just one example of two different set dances, and both are very distinct, and they're known um, as the same term um, and thought of distinctly. So I will um, show in a little while how I've represented that. To give you an idea of some of the ways in which we can speak about two people, I took the um, example of some of the musicians earlier, the, the middle person in the group of fiddle players was James Kelly, and he happens to be my teacher. Um, so I have a fairly good idea of his relationship to his father, uh, who is also a fiddle player and concertina player, originally from Clare, and moved to Dublin in the 50s and raised his family in Dublin. And James is now um, a US citizen who lives in Miami, Florida. Uh, so his relationship, musically speaking, with his father, um, there's numerous relationships that you can draw upon. So the two have played in a band before, Kiltori Lion, um, musicians of Leinster. And the, um, 
in Leinster being a province in Ireland, which um, Dublin is a part of, Dublin is the most um, populated city in Leinster. And so uh, the two played in this band together. They recorded together um, with Kelturi Lyon. Um, he is the son of John Kelly Sr. And his, as you would imagine, his ornamentation and his repertoire is heavily influenced by the way his father played and what his father played. So this is just a way of giving you an idea of the types of things that I am um, representing between the two people. And what I like to say is that it's very nice to be able to tell these, these stories the way you would um, verbalize them when introducing a tune or a piece. So for instance, a jig called Humors of the Sheen um, is played by a particular musician and I first heard this tune from, the, from her playing, therefore I can um, make that statement accordingly. In addition, there's the example of student and teacher in harp playing, Janet Harbison being a very uh, influential harp teacher and harp player, um, who is the founder and director of the Belfast Harp Orchestra. Um, they also recorded an album with the Chieftains, and that rose their profile considerably, um, raised their profile considerably. And Grania Hambly was a member of the Belfast Harp Orchestra, and um, likewise her ornamentation um, to choose just one aspect, her arrangement style, her technique, her um, aesthetics were all influenced by her teacher Janet Harbison. So, her style of playing is very close to the style that Janet taught as part of the Belfast Harp Orchestra. So I'm anticipating the ontology will be used to tell a variety of stories using linked data, mainly to talk about influence between musicians. And this is something that um, subject matter experts will find helpful including repertoire and style influences and approaches to playing. Um, sometimes teaching roles didn't take a, um, take a formal, um, weren't, weren't formalized in the typical sense of a student going to a teacher for lessons. A lot of times musicians will talk about uh, their influences Maybe they were family members and they might have learned um, through watching someone play um, and describe their sort of tacit um, instruction that way. Uh, so informal teaching does factor into traditional music and dance quite a bit. And to describe the impact, uh, many musicians will mention one another as influences and um, hearing a tune played or he first hearing something played um, or they were struck by the beauty of someone singing this particular song. Um, so there's a lot of, of um, mentions that you find and being able to um, encode that is, is important. As well as um, in addition to something that could be derived from commercial music, being able to say, even through non-commercial uh, means, if we have non-commercial recordings of musicians playing together, these types of relationships, playing with someone and knowing of someone um, is very useful. As well as if someone has won a particular competition or awarded an honor like the, um, the traditional music uh, awards that are held annually, by the um, Irish language broadcasting company TG Cahar. Uh, they award the Gradam Kjol, which just simply means music awards. And this is a very important honor. So all of the musicians and um, singers, and in some cases, dancers and poets, they are honored um, annually and uh, so this is an important distinction to make then if someone has received an honor like that. And so also describing the different types of outputs that someone may have produced. So in addition to being a performer and a teacher and uh, a composer, they could have edited collections 
um, or put out a tutor related to their specific instrument and other materials. Uh, and again, these roles are, um, are uh, very difficult to um, capture in terms of completeness because many people wear more than one hat and within a specific piece, they could be the composer of a particular tune. They could have arranged the set of tunes that the composition falls into. They could be um, um, the uh, band leader. They could be the musician. So it goes on and on. And um, so there's many roles that, that musicians and dancers wear in Irish traditional music. So the process of litmus and the outcomes or next. The first step was to really understand the needs of traditional music and dance and to, to look at existing authority files and uh, assess where, um, where the users would, uh, would, would be looking for information, developing competency questions to um, address user needs and address the types of information that users would be interested in. So examining current ontologies, um, we took a look at Doremus, and Doremus is um, built on Ferber Uhuru, and this is uh, largely the um, model that we're using. Uh, there's a lot less Doremus um, than, than uh, originally planned, so um, removing a lot of the classical music um, structure from Doremus um, has lightened the ontology considerably. And then the next step was to extend it with um, classes and properties to suit traditional music and dance, as well as um, mapping equivalent properties um, and adding our own additional um, properties, which I will show examples of in a moment. And um, the process of developing the new properties was uh, very important to um, really capture the types of relationships that musicians and dancers use in uh, describing things, while also um, avoiding directly um, working with human subjects, which was uh, outside of the scope of the project, and we don't have permission to do that. So um, the final step was to select a uh, data set to showcase the ontology, and this is something that um, I will also describe coming up. So just to look at the competency questions, the uh, the range is from broad to specific, including contextual details and collection details. So geographic locations that are associated with musicians and the interrelatedness of the various tunes and songs is also um, important. And a lot of times people will look for these melodic links or um, tracing a song or a tune through history to try and determine how, for instance, you know, well, there are many cases of um, both Ireland and Scotland arguing over the same material. So this is something that uh, they, they uh, could potentially use to trace origins and um, maybe not come closer to deciding, but um, have more information at least to make a scholarly argument. So the um, contextual information, certain poems or other types of um, literature that may be associated with a particular piece of music or dance. And then collection focused questions. Um, a lot of times you're looking for the earliest publication of something. Um, so which versions of something can be found in which of the published collections. So these are these are very um, very good exemplar uh, queries that have been used to ensure that the ontology meets these needs. So the, the development of the properties that I mentioned earlier 
but is um, important because um, the relationships found in traditional music and dance are, I think, the richest part of the ontology, is just adding these properties between people and um, music and uh, the uh, geographic locations and other contextual details. So developing these properties um, involved not human subjects, but the words of human subjects through commercial album notes. And these ranged from uh, notes on LPs from 1962 to um, 2012. And the important part was to get a representative sample of the different types of instrumentation and the um, uh, in trying to represent uh, women and men more or less equally um, but there is a gender disparity in traditional music and dance uh, women are vastly underrepresented in commercial recordings so um, while this is not the case more recently when you had to be signed to a record label, um, this was a this was an issue. Uh, men were largely represented and women left out. So the um, range of instruments and ensembles, some of this was uh, solo, some of it was duet and small group, and other albums were uh, of bands and larger ensembles. So, the types of relationships, just to highlight a few, um, this is a great example of how musicians talk about their music. And in fact, this mirrors very well the way musicians introduce tunes. I can, um, I can hear James Kelly speaking these words uh, because it's exactly how he would convey the information. Um, alternate titles where musicians you know, musical heritage and lineage uh, lies, and the uh, instruments played, um, details about someone's um, date of birth and death, and um, even an informal relationship example here, Peter Horan was known to play this tune on the flute. That's kind of a long relationship, um, but this is, this is the type of thing, you know, um, from this information, we can we can infer that Peter Horan knew this tune. So uh, while Peter Horan is not on this album, um, this type of detail can then be represented if um, if I was uh, including um, material outside of just what's in the recording um, through the liner notes. I can make uh, sure that these relationships are represented. So within Litmus, the ontology is the primary output, and it became necessary then to um, develop two bilingual vocabularies, one related to instruments in traditional music and dance, and uh, dancing feet or percussive dance counts as an instrument for sound recordings. So this is included as well as various types of singing as instruments. So it's meant to represent everything in our, in our um, collections at the Irish Traditional Music Archive, and it also represents the chosen data set. Um, the second vocabulary is a bilingual um, tune type vocabulary using SCOS, and this is to account for the different types of tunes, jigs, reels, slip jigs, um, marches, Scots bays, and all of these are mapped out to um, Wikidata properties when appropriate. Uh, and where there wasn't a property, one was added. And I've contributed numerous uh, Irish language translations to both instruments and to tune types. Uh, so Wikidata is the richer for it. Um, and the data set that's going to be demonstrating the ontology is the Gradum Kjol uh, data set that is um, archived. And because the Irish Traditional Music Archive uh, provided the metadata for this, um, 
we've been able to enrich the JSON metadata um, and work towards um, representing the um, musicians and tunes and tune types and instruments all uh, using the vocabularies produced by Litmus. So the tunes are matched to, uh, the specific tunes in the Grabham uh, data set are matched to um, port IDs, and port is a uh, non-comprehensive tune index, but it is comprehensive to the um, digitized old music collections that the archive has. So um, published collections of dance tunes by um, Joyce and Petrie and Ken and James Goodman. These are all collectors who lived in the past um, 200, 300 years. We even have um, digitized Bunting published collections. So um, Edward Bunting was very um, influential in resurrecting the, um, the harp playing traditions of the 17th century. So. Um, there's a there's a wealth of um, of archival collections with um, the closest thing we have to URIs. So the archive doesn't have other um, permanent URLs or any type of identifier system um, in place yet. This is all in progress. So um, we're linking to port IDs whenever possible because these are actually. Um, you know, stable identifiers and they're not going to change. And for those tunes that don't match, we're using a TunePal ID. And TunePal is a locator music information retrieval application. Uh, the IDs are mapped then to other, um, other collections of tunes that are published on the web, including the session.org and irishtune.info and many other um, tune sources. The performers are getting um, linked to their music brains IDs. This is probably um, more comprehensive than Wikidata because um, traditional musicians tend to not be um, included in Wikidata. Uh, you don't see you don't see many of them that are less than very high profile internationally represented um, on Wikidata, but they tend to have music brains IDs. So we're using those and attempting to create new ones whenever possible. The two types are um, used, are using the litmus thesaurus for, uh, for tune types, and each tune type is mapped to a corresponding Wikidata property ID, as well as the instruments. They are also um, uh, going to be linked to the corresponding um, uh, aspect of the uh, instrument thesaurus and Wikidata IDs. The graph here is the lit, uh, Litmus um, Gratum Piole dataset. So this is a representation of um, how we're treating a single performance in this data set. So the musicians named here are all performing the same set of tunes together. And um, so Tony Lennan is a fiddle player, so his, um, uh, his instrument, he has an associated instrument ID, and this matches to a Wikidata ID. He performs these sets of tunes with um, other musicians, Matt Malloy, the flute player from the Chieftains, Arden McGlynn on guitar, and Noel Hill, a concertina player. So they're all mapped to their corresponding instruments in our thesaurus. And Tony is linked out to the various tunes that he's playing. This is a set of tunes, so each has a port ID. And uh, they are all of the same tune type. They're a set of reels. So there's no difference in the type of tune. They're just different tunes, but they're all reels. So this is linking then to the real concept within our concept scheme in SOS. Uh, and that concept real is linked out to a corresponding Wikidata ID. And so from there, you can um, go into much more detail if you want to on each performer 
Um, as I just articulated, there's many more things that aren't on the graph. Matt Malloy, um, his authority file will associate him with the chieftains, and um, Noel Hill is associated with numerous musicians uh, with whom he's recorded. So um, there's going to be other relationships that uh, can be inferred from this authority data as well. Some future opportunities for litmus include the application beyond simply Irish traditional music, but to take a look at um, other European music traditions that have similar considerations between informal learning environments and the way in which music is shared between musicians uh, and the types of contexts that um, share similarities with, with Ireland and um, any diaspora that may occur in these traditions. To do this though, to, uh, to actually apply the ontology, there's much more infrastructure that's needed at the archive before this can happen. So while um, our current infrastructure is in progress, um, eventually um, uh, cleaning up our thesaurus in our, our library catalog uh, is a first step and reconciling entities in our catalog to authority data. Um, would go a long way towards, um, for instance, uh, the 12 different spellings of a particular name in Irish um, and the anglicized version of the same name. So a particular musician could be represented about 20 different ways in our catalog, um, spelling-wise and uh, language-wise, and any combination of the two. So um, being able to um, reconcile these as the same person will uh, work wonders in terms of associating various records and preparing us for linked data implementation. And the, the specific areas where um, this would be applicable is the port collection that I mentioned before, and this is found at port.ipa.ie, and you can have a look there at the various collections that are found there. Uh, the structure of the, the um, address is, is very stable and the tunes themselves are numbered. Has a, each one has a unique um, number. So even if there are multiple um, versions of the, the same tune or same melody, um, these have different port IDs. So it enables the, um, the eventual you know, statements about the relationships between these tunes, if they're the, uh, similar versions or um, song version of a tune or um, a real version of a jig, there's melodies that have been rendered in different tune types and even um, uh, slow versus fast. So um, there's a lot of opportunities for making relationship statements within the port collections and eventually the digital library uh, changes that are underway. Um, this will hopefully enable uh, some rich exploration of content there um, when uh, the, the naming structure is standardized and um, some of the ontology can be applied then to the items within the digital library. So that this is going to be a unique ontology um, in that it's going to uh, describe our material very, very well. Um, and I think it will be interesting to, to see whether or not um, this can be rolled out and implemented um, in small part or in large part uh, over the next few years as the information infrastructure um, of the archive is undergoing changes. So opportunities arising from litmus involve the collaboration between the organization and other institutions with traditional music content. Uh, there's quite a bit of material in the Library of Congress and in Baltimore, Maryland, as well as in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and other academic organizations, institutions, and um, uh, academic libraries that um, would be very, very helpful to um, 
at least reference the, uh, the related items um, to our own collections. So um, that would be the next step uh, as well to try and, and foster some sort of collaborative transnational effort to implement uh, traditional music linked data. And the other trick is getting this insider knowledge, getting this practitioner-based information to enrich the um, explicit relationships that can be um, that can be seen from a from an item, from um, an album, or from a performance. Um, but getting these hidden relationships and hidden um, pieces of information to enrich um, the, the uh, collection items. Um, this is going to involve collaboration between musicians and dancers and the archive to contribute this knowledge and really enrich the record. We also are suffering from a lack of indexing of traditional tunes and indexing of melodies. Uh, and so it's very difficult to reference um, any one um, number for, uh, for a specific tune because there are multiple numbers and every possible index has substantial drawbacks, either incompleteness or um, it's, it's very unorganized and, um, and suffers from a lack of reliability and information quality. So there is no good indexing um, uh, project underway for traditional tunes yet. And hopefully this is something that um, can take place soon to enable additional linked data work. So the, um, the copyright and rights sharing guidelines are um, additionally uh, a challenge because whereas we can use the traditional knowledge labels and we can use Creative Commons licenses, um, they are they are close, but maybe not um, uh, um, completely representative of the type of um, rights that we allow our uh, contributors to have over their own materials. So um, the archive may wish to um, create their own um, rights statements and refer to um, more common rights statements when there's an equivalence and create some of these personalized uh, rights for their own. Um, and it would be nice too to um, eventually be able to share the copyright friendly portion of our collections through an API and really allow people to access this um, interesting data and encourage creative reuse in that way. Gormadiv, thank you very much, and I'll be here to take your questions. I can uh, tell her you set a pause. Um, we'll do Q&A at the end, and Lindsay will be available via Slack, so I can type in any questions if you want to hold them for her. Um, next up is Stephen Folsom, and in a combination of recent positions at both Cornell and Harvard uh, Library, Stephen's career focuses on best practices and standards development in local and national discussions. As a member of the LD4L and LD50 Mellon Foundation funded grants, he participates in the development efforts of tools and data models meant to aid the adoption of the data in libraries. you paid attention to that bio, um, but nothing in there screams special format, so I do feel a little out of place. But I assure you that this this work that we're talking about today um, is a special format um, a, a couple different ways. Um, haven't used PowerPoint in a while, so. Thank you. This, this, this is a participatory talk. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I, enough uh, self-effacing self jokes. Um, um, so
so this this talk is going to include um, a description of work that we described to Mellon as an output of uh, the LD for P grant. Um, we at Cornell specifically are centering our work around uh, cataloging in RDF uh, 45 RPM vinyl, um, specifically uh, Sinatra and uh, uh, contemporary uh, popular artists. Um, we'll get into a little bit about uh, why we chose to incorporate Discogs into this work. Um, if you're a music cataloger, that's, it's not a stretch to imagine why, but I'll, I'll try to justify that decision. Um, get into specifics about conversions. So how was it that we used the, the JSON API to convert to BitFrame? Um, uh, mapping values, so uh, Discogs, of course, has its own values. Um, how do we turn those, in, turn those um, sometimes controlled strings into um, URIs that, uh, that we can use. Um, and uh, a lot of this you'll, you'll start to understand is opportunistic in that um, we're, we, we set out to develop a bunch of tools and, um, and how to make those tools more valuable. And I'll describe questioning authorities, a, a lookup service that Cornell is working on and, and how, it, um, how it discards plays into that. Um, hints about cataloging UI. Um, I use hints there because we still have some work to do. Um, we, we'll give those caveats. And um, I, I was reluctant to use the word practical in the presentation because um, it reminded me of a grad uh, advisor talking about um, too much how I done it good um, uh, publications. And I'll just say this is a how we did it. And I hope you can help us to improve and, uh, and, and do it better. So. Um, I'll, I'll suggest some areas that we might uh, take this work and or directions we might take this work and I'd love to hear um, other thoughts on that. So the background, as promised. Um, so we, like I said, we initially set out to do RDF cataloging um, on 45 vinyl. Um, we, this was another opportunistic choice. We, we knew that with popular music around Frank Sinatra that there was likely to be data that exists that we could start to demonstrate the value of using data not created by, by libraries. Um, uh, I'm not questioning that decision. It's just, yeah, to ward off a question later. Um, uh, uh, so another thing to point out here is that uh, there's a lack of mark cataloging for this type of material. So it really frees us up to make decisions that aren't um, embedded in our mark assumptions now. Uh, examples of this would be, um, and, and music catalogers do do this, so I don't want to say that it doesn't happen, but um, part goal relationships, so if a song is represented in Wikidata, we can link to that and, and start to come at, or have different types of resources entified so that we can have some, some interesting relationships or ways or competency questions to take the previous speaker's turn. Um, We've also promised to assess the effectiveness of this on, on discovery. So why Discogs? Um, again, this is a cataloging uh, project, and um, we know that we will do anything in our power to not have to key in um, data that somebody else has already keyed in somewhere else. Um, 45s are not well represented in Wikidata, and catalogers all, in our interviews with catalogers um, in developing the project um, and, and in other situations, we know for sure that catalogers go to Discogs to copy and paste data in, into our mark records. So a little bit about Discogs. Um, it purports to be a comprehensive uh, music database and marketplace uh, with almost half a million people contributing. Uh, and the result of that is more than 11 million recordings um, recording descriptions and six million artist descriptions. I bolded marketplace here because I think that's a really important point. Um, the motivations for Discogs are about um, being precise in your description for what it is that you're trying to sell or buy. So there's, there's, there's a threshold for quality in the data inherent in this idea of um, making clear to any potential uh, seller or buyers of the kind of um, resource you're, you're interested in. Also around that marketplace is, um, and this is a gross generalization, but um, 
collectors of vinyl tend to like interesting things, and um, uh, and singles or 45s are a thing that um, we, we they do certainly release singles now, but um, you can't collect an iTunes single. Or you can't collect them; they'll gladly sell it to you. But um, <laughs> but it's not the same as an out, like object collection collecting, and so there, there's sort of this special formats um, uh, idea embedded in, in this community and in, in this marketplace. Uh, we wanted to further substantiate our claim that uh, there wasn't a lot of mark for this material um, and that Discogs would be a good place. So our method for doing this was select 50 items from the collection and uh, search them both in Discogs and in OCLC and a uh, pretty dramatic set of results here. Um, one thing we found was that for 50 items search, it took about an hour in both environments, so it wasn't like um, there was going to be a cost, of, uh, uh, increased cost of searching um, in Discogs. We, um, we noticed that there was almost 75% um, uh, coverage in Discogs and, and only eight. So with that behind us, I can get into the specifics about conversion. Um, and it's important to point out here that we are not the first library to consider Discogs in a conversion project. Michigan State, a couple years back, uh, developed a workflow to convert uh, Discogs to Mark. So if you're a music catalog, I'm sure you're familiar with their project. Um, it was helpful for us in a couple of ways. Um, their interpretation of the Discogs uh, release type um, uh, as, as a fervor manifestation really um, uh, substantiated our, our inclination to map that data to a BigFrame instance. Um, Discogs Masters aligns loosely with uh, Big Frameworks. Um, we made a decision, um, I'm not sure if they made the same decision, but we made a decision to, um, I believe they were converting uh, <coughs> Discogs releases to um, mark bibliographic format, so they they weren't creating mark authorities, and um, we we went we changed a little bit there in, in creating uh, the frameworks. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about our um, genre mappings, but I should point out that um, they also did genre mappings, and we just didn't have access to that prior to um, our, our attempt at it. So. Um, uh, I want to, I mean, for the for the metadata librarians in the room, this should come as no surprise when we do mappings. Um, the, the phenomenon that we see regularly showed up again in this work. So we had examples of terms that were mapping one to one. So like go go in Discogs mapped to go go dip, uh, music in LCGFT. We had examples of one to many. So soundtrack in Discogs mapped to uh, film soundtracks. Um, or television soundtracks. Um, examples of many to one, so opera and operetta, mapped operas, and um, as I may have suggested prior, we should probably compare our choices with Michigan State because we were not music librarians making our mapping, it was um, myself and, and the developer. So um, that, that'll be tested shortly. Um, this is an example where form meets function. This slide is a, um, a pretty suboptimal slide. Our, um, our conversion or our, our mapping specs were suboptimal. Um, again, we were being practical. Um, we took the, the description of 50, uh, the 50 that we searched um, for our OCLC evaluation and this got its coverage evaluation and um, annotated the JSON from the uh, Discogs API, and if if you get a hold of the slides, you'll notice that um, it's really just a uh, in JSON. There's no formal way to do annotations, uh, and so uh, we we found a way to do that. Um, this will not validate. Do not use this JSON. It's not going to work. Um, nor are the comments going to give you machine actionable um, uh, ways to convert the data. These are pros that I, I wrote to a developer, the developer would ask lots of questions, comes back and forth, so, um, but you can see our decisions there. Um, uh, our developer, Tim Worrell, uh, produced this slide, um, just sort of 
helps you understand how we went from that, that frozen adjacent to actual mappings. Um, the values on the left are values in uh, discogs, and they convert to uh, bit frames. So we have style and genre uh, mapping, style and genre in, in discogs mapping to genre form terms. Uh, the label, Columbia label, is um, mapping to a provision activity with a role of label. Um, it's uh, a situation where the bit frame model um, allows for roles that um, um, there's an extensible way to talk about roles, um, the artist, and so on. So we, I, I won't delve too deep into that. Um, I should point out uh, we were lucky enough to have LC's recording, sound recording, analog profile. Um, I'm going to go through a bunch of exceptions here, things that we changed about that. But I should point out that um, they have a profile to um, create forms in the BitFrame editor that we used uh, for our cataloging tool. Um, and uh, really all we did was take this general vinyl or uh, LP um, profile and turn it into a 45s profile. Um, some other things we did was, was um, point to real world objects in id.lc.gov rather than LCNF. Um, we're pointing to uh, geoname places um, rather than um, uh, ID um, terms for places and the idea here is that it's vocabulary that's optimized for place description and we can start to do things like bounding box searches in, in our discovery when, when we get to that point. Um, as I said, we've customized this for 45 so the default extent um, reflects um, what a, a typical 45 measurement looks like. Um, uh, we pruned the identifier list in the, um, in the um, form. The idea here is that catalogers saw a bunch of identifiers that they just didn't, didn't anticipate using for this content. So um, there's a question about how shareable our profiles should be, whether or not they should be reflecting workflows or more general, and, and we can have a discussion about that. Um, uh, as I alluded to before, we wanted to describe songs as separate works. We, of course, changed the held by value um, to uh, Cornell instead of uh, LC. Um, if anybody has experience with uh, the big frame editor profiles, there's this use value from uh, distinction you can make that allows you to tell the system um, which lookup service you want to use. And LC's profiles um, point to a URL behind their firewall, um, and we went uh, we wanted to integrate with our questioning authority lookup service. Um, I'm told that the tool that we are using for uh, as an RDF cataloger has a way um, in, the, in its um, storage of the data to um, uh, track um, changes uh, that doesn't require us to have um, administrative metadata in, in that data layer. So using um, Sanofi as a tool that Stanford's building is using Memento that allows us to, to track those changes. So we don't need that um, in, in our data. A little bit about questioning authority, if you haven't heard of it. It is a lookup service um, principally positioned within uh, the Sambara community. Um, that's previously Hydra, previously something else. Um, uh, but the idea is that they, they and we uh, need a need lookup services where uh, we can support um, type ahead or drop down functionality and tools that we build. Um, it provides uh, restful um, approaches to query control vocabularies. Um, uh, something to point out: up until recently, uh, it was I, th I think the return was a URI and a label. Um, now we can set it up so that when you select a term and get the URI, you can get some uh, actual RDF back. So this is really important in a copy cataloging workflow where um, we want to actually bring data into, into our system. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, and I should point out that Discogs is, has been approved by the QA keepers as a, a, um, a shift uh, supported um, authority now. And you can look at the conversion module that, that makes that happen. 
uh, in case all of that didn't make sense, maybe this will. Um, we have Sinopia the cataloging tool. Uh, it sends a search request to QA. QA knows which vocabulary you tell the QA which vocabulary you're interested in. It goes and does a search against that um, authority, in this case, Dick Discogs. It returns JSON. You decide whether or not um, there's something there that you want to link to. You tell it you want to link to something, and it generates the RDF using the translation mod model or module. Um, I think it's really important to point out that this is not like other non RDF music conversion projects. So you may have know about how Linked Brains uh, has attempted to convert Music Brains RDF on in mass. So there, it's like a um, a complete conversion or attempts to be a complete conversion of music brains data. This instead is more of a at the point of need conversion. It's sort of a, a catalog supervised conversion of individual resources at a time. So this isn't some some big conversion project that um, is going to try to create uh, that sort of echo of Discogs only as RDF. Um, and also to point out here, Oh, and, and with that, with that supervision of the conversion, um, the data can come into the application or will be able to come into the application. And if the cataloger doesn't like what we did with the translation, um, doesn't agree with something in Discogs, um, or wants to add more, all of those things will be possible in the cataloging tool. So it's really just get some data here, in here, the cataloger vets it, and then we produce the RDF. Um, it's also a one-time conversion, so we're not trying to create this um, open-ended relationship and try to re rerun those conversions. It's get as much as we can out of Discogs, and now the, the data record is the RDF, at least in, in, our, in, our, in our minds. So how does this play out in the UI? Um, uh, tomorrow, uh, close collaborator, developer, um, and maybe Huda in the back might have had something to do with a little bit of this. Um, this, I, I was told to stress that this is a live Synopia instance asterisk um, on a local machine. <laughs> and so uh, everything that I described earlier is happening here. On the uh, left uh, is searching the, searching discogs through QA. It's returning the, the JSON and being, um, uh, presented to the cataloger there. And what's nice here is that you can kind of just do this big sloppy search for Frank Sinatra among my souvenir 78 RPMs, and the, the results themselves get reshaped so for, for the level of specificity that the cataloger adds, adds to, to that search. And so if they were to select one, um, the translation module then converts it to, to the RDF. I won't go too deep. Um, so future work, um, I should, I stressed earlier that we haven't fully integrated this into Synopia. We're waiting on a milestone that allows uh, Synopia to accept RDF. Um, if you, and this is a plug for Jeremy's talk tomorrow on, on Synopia, so you'll get an update on that. Um, we're excited about um, the clone milestone, and in the meantime, we'll have to ask ourselves whether or not we want to um, uh, just play with the, the profile without the Discogs inter integration. Um, I said before, but I'll say it again, we want to test the mappings, we want to test the profile, so there may be more adjustments to um, the LC profile that we want to make for, for this work. Hoda, um, of course, will be doing some evaluation of our UI decisions, whether or not the lookup, the presentation of, of the, the lookup is working, um, what, how can we make that better? Um, no? <laughs> okay. Somebody will, hopefully. I mean, that's what we say anyways, that we do iterative design and user-centered stuff, so. Um, uh, we have done some work to understand how often Discogs identifiers are in Wikidata, and we're happy to report that there's over uh, 100,000. And so what this means is that we can um, brace ourselves or try not to have so many Sinopia URIs in our data, we can say 
in our conversion process, um, search this uh, Discogs identifier against Wikidata, and when we see that, we can replace the what we would normally have as a Synopia URI, um, have that be a, a Wikidata URI, or Wikidata may also buy you um, access to other URIs, so if the same resource, same Wikidata resource is reconciled against um, Discogs, but also LCNAF, we might decide to, to swap out the Synopia URI for, for one of those others. Um, I talked about prior art, art earlier in terms of mark cataloging and the use of Discogs. There's also a lot of prior art just in conversion. So we discussed this early on, uh, or RDF, non-RDF to RDF conversion, and we discussed this early on in our project and we made the practical decision to not make the perfect non-RDF to RDF um, conversion for all data sources, but rather focusing on getting some of this Discogs JSON to convert to um, a specific um, RDF output. Um, in the future, uh, we might consider backing up from that a little bit and thinking about how RML, um, the RDF uh, mapping language, it's a general mapping language that's specifically designed to be able to understand um, data structures that aren't in RDF and produce RDF. So we might, and there's tooling that can allow us to maybe have configurations so that it's not just discogs that we can create these lookups for, but any non-RDF. So um, if you use JSON forum for your image cataloging, um, it could be largely the same workflow, just um, with different configurations rather than hard coding the conversion into a QA module. Um, I guess at this point I would say that QA has a, um, a saying, question, you should question your authorities and you should question your presenters too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, save your questions, proceed into it to the end. And we'll have the presenters plus our remote presenters come and talk. So now